Hello. No, no. <laughs> this is my first panel for Dragon Con this year. Uh, I just came in late last night, but I'm kind of curious here. How many people came into Dragon Con this year and, and you just arrived today? All right. How many arrived yesterday? How many arrived Wednesday? Wednesday? <laughs> Has anybody arrived before Wednesday? Wow. <laughs> Wow, okay, yeah, Dragon Con keeps getting longer and longer, which is cool, I like it. Um, though I I'm, came in like midnight last night, so I, I'm here and I'm, I'm doing my best. So uh, this is going to be our, our panel on women in science and technology. Uh, so I will get a, a chance for everyone here on the panel to introduce themselves, but again, I kind of want to get a sense of the audience here. In terms of science and technology, how many people here are professionals in a science or technology field? Okay. How many people are amateurs in a science or, or hobbyist in a science and technology field? Okay. <laughs> Any other categories that I want to? Students. Yeah. Yeah. Students. students, okay. Students in a science or technology field. Um, uh, uh, writers or creative personnel in science or technology. Okay. All right. What am I missing? Yeah. Okay, I got them all. Um, all right, thank you. And so in science and technology, again, for professionals in the field, I just want, because I, I get beat up for this in, in lumping everything. So how many people are here professionals in the technology field, all right, as opposed to professionals in the science field? Okay, all right, so kind of an equal mix. Again, am I missing anything? Some we do both. Okay, all right, science and technology. Okay, so... Um, so my next thing is, and again, we're, we're going to uh, kind of moderate the panel here. Uh, I've been thinking about this since I was told I was going to moderate the panel. I've moderated the panel for a few years now, and we kind of covered different things each year. And I was thinking really hard, what do we want the theme of the panel to be this year? And I kind of break it down into different categories. And one category is women in science and technology who have external obstacles to how they proceed. But another category would be internal obstacles to how they can succeed or move on. And then another category is just getting away from obstacles and just talk about cool things that women have done in science and technology. And then the fourth category was role models. Women who get into it, who's their role model? Now it might be a real person, it might be you know, someone they know, it might be a fictional character. When we run into an obstacle, who do we, you know, how would so and so handle it? And it might be someone in the modern day, or it might be someone historical. It could be a female, it could be a male, you know, it doesn't, it could be an animal. It doesn't have to be any particular gender or, or species, you know. So, um, of those four categories, I want to get a sense of the audience here. So, again, we have external obstacles, internal obstacles. Um, cool things that have been done by women and role models. So you can vote for multiple, you can't vote for all four, okay? <laughs> but you can vote for multiple if you want. So how many people are most interested in hearing about how women have dealt with external obstacles? Okay. How many people are interested in hearing about ways of dealing with internal obstacles? Okay, uh, all right. How many people are here are interested in hearing, well, what did I say was the third one? Cool things women have done. Oh, cool things women have done in science and technology. Okay, all right. And how many are interested in hearing about role models? Okay, all right, so we can kind of drop role models. Um, for me, I always ask myself, how would Janeway handle it, so. <laughs> okay, so, so knowing that now, we'll introduce the panel and then we'll kind of go from there, all right. Oh, hi, my name is Eternal Zan, and I'm a longtime Dragon Con attendee, and I'm a regular contributor to the Dragon Con Report podcast, and also an annual guest on the 50 Days of Dragon Con podcast by the Unique Geek. And my day job is I am an IT professional at a retail store that also has a very um, large online presence, and so they've been online for close to 20 years now, so they're experienced in that area as well. Okay. Oh, good morning, uh, afternoon, sorry, I'm a not a morning person, so this is morning to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 
I'm Dr. Theta Daniels Race. So if you want to be formal, as my students say, Dr. Race, literally R A C E, so you can implications, jokes, it's cool. Um, I will put my students part of the race group, although we have another name, Applied Hybrid Electronic Materials and Structures. Okay, bottom line is I'm a professor at Louisiana State University in the Division of Electrical, thank you, in the Division of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Um, I was a professor for, I'm gonna say over a decade or more, also at Duke University up in North Carolina. And um, I guess I'm supposed to say like, uh, they say in academia pedigree, which I think sounds awful. It's like calling you like a dog, but I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> so my pedigree is I did my um, bachelor's at <laughs> 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 I did my bachelor's at Rice University in Houston, Texas. I did my master's at Stanford um, on the West Coast, Silicon Valley and all. And I did my doctorate at Cornell. And no, my family did not have money to pay for that sort of thing. Thank God for scholarships and fellowships and school loans. <laughs> okay, my name is Ilanka Dunin. I'm moderator of the panel. I do not have a single degree, so so we'll just start for there. I, I went to college, but it wasn't the right fit, so I went and I found my own path. And and the path seems to have been successful because I get invited to universities all the time to talk about the path that I followed. I am a veteran. I was in the Air Force for six years. I have a yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very proud of that, very proud of that. And it's interesting that having been in the Air Force in my 20s, um, decades ago, I won't say how many decades, but decades. No, I will. I'm proud of my age. I am 59, and I show how good that 59 can look. So um, having been in the Air Force, it is still opening doors for me today. I, I happen to be living in Washington, D.C. I just moved there about a year ago. And uh, many of the places that I'm applying for work for clients, they're excited about the fact that I'm a veteran. So it opens doors. So it, it's just something about external obstacles and, and uh, be aware of what you do today may have far-reaching advantages in the future, even if you don't see the advantages right now. So what, a little bit more about me. Um, I traveled for a while and then I became a, a game designer. I got involved with a startup uh, called Simutronics and we hit it. Uh, and uh, we, uh, I rode that for 24 years. We made millions of dollars. I had a corner office and then you know, 24 years was a good run and eventually started coming down. So then I went out into this consulting world, consulted at some game companies and uh, then widened it. And I found that non-game companies were paying me a lot more <laughs> than game companies were. So I'm currently uh, consulting for various government agencies in Washington, D.C. My client, as of last Friday, uh, I'm currently working for the Department of Agriculture. So, uh, and that'll last for a few months, and then I'm going to go on and do something else. Um, as a sidetrack to all that, I am an author. I have a website on the world's most famous unsolved codes, uh, and it's a very interesting journey how I got to there. Uh, I've written a book about, a couple books now about codes, and um, I've been a consultant to various people about cryptography. For example, the author Dan Brown, who wrote Da Vinci Code, he uh, called me and asked me if he could ask me some questions, and uh, he thanked me by naming one of the characters in his novels after me. So if you've read uh, The Lost Symbol, there's a character in there named Nola Kay, which is Ilanka, uh, scrambled. So, so these are the, the paths uh, that I have followed, and um, so that's enough about me. I could probably talk loud enough if you guys could hear me, but that might end my career at Georgia, or here because I would run, my, run out of voice. So I went to Georgia Tech just down the road. I got, thank you. <clears throat> I got my master's degree in aerospace engineering, and then I, <laughs> yay. And uh, then I went to uh, California to work for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And I've been there for 20 years, and since I've been there, I've worked on the Cassini mission, the Mars Exploration Rovers and uh, Curiosity rover, and I am on, cur currently on Curiosity, which is hard to say, and also on the Mars 2020 rover. We're building the rover right now, and she'll launch in 2020, so that's why we have such a unique name for her. <laughs> okay, I am not as interested, uh, interesting as the rocket scientist. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm Tracy Wilson. I, um, I'm all sorts of science geek here. I have a degree in geology and computer science and a master's in education and a master's in computer science. Um, but I work for Teals right now, which is part of Microsoft Philanthropies. We are promoting computer science education in all high schools in the US. 
So, and before that, I taught Java programming, web design, and all other things computer science to high schoolers here in Georgia. So, um, I have not been in as many places, but um, I did work in industry. I've done everything from Cisco networking to web design to teaching. So, um, don't ask me many geology questions. It's been a very long time. <laughs> I had them all lined up. Well, you, uh, but my, my, when I get my geology degree, I wanted to be on the Mars NASA team. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, um, so, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, we got a great panel here. We have an amazing panel. Lots of all, all different perspectives on things. So, I wanted to start off. Is there anyone here in the audience that just has a burning question? You came here to this panel because you want to know or find out something? Yes. because my wonderful husband is there um, in the front row. Uh, differential equations is, we for short, we call it a diffy Q. And um, my husband, who is phenomenal, he's actually got his MD and his JD, so doctor, lawyer. And he's now a professor. He's practiced in both fields, not at the same time. He didn't get his JD. He never got sued, so it was nothing like that. Um, but as he said, when we were undergraduate at Rice, he thought about being an engineer, too. He heard that there was this class called diffy Q, which sounded too much like difficult. So. <laughs> It's not. It's um, diff and that's fantastic. She's in. This, you said high school or? They, they have a STEM school in Burnett County called. Oh my okay. gosh. It's STEM. STEM. Uh, Tech. Oh yeah. okay okay. Uh, unpack STEM really quick. Oh okay. STEM stands same one as uh, stands for science, technology, engineering, math, and also these days we say STEAM, so we add the arts: science, technology, engineering, arts, and math which also is, is quite applicable. But to your question, sir, yes, differential equations and number theory, first off, be really glad she's taking this in high school. It's not that it's so hard, but it will definitely give her a leg up in college. Yes. With our own son right now, who's going to like a top magnet school in Baton Rouge, and there are good schools in Baton Rouge, y'all. So, <laughs> he speaks three languages, na 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 na, <laughs> from a school he went to before that. But no, um, the magnet school there, their math program is as such, if you come in as a freshman with, ge with geometry, which normally people take maybe as a, as a sophomore, then you get to calculus. But our son came in with algebra, as we wanted him to do, to get a firm backing in that, so he will not get calculus by senior year. So we're going to have to find, pay for, whatever, somewhere he can take calculus before college, because I had the experience of going to college without calculus. Went to a good school, all-girls Catholic school, believe it or not, but back then they actually didn't quite believe girls needed calculus. So I was one of two people in the freshman class of all of Rice who had never had calculus. And, t and tell you, your daughter will avoid the, as I looked at, those of you who had calculus know about an integral symbol, I put together the homework group because I'm like, I'm going to get this stuff. And I looked at the book and I said, what's that funny little S thing? That's like asking people what's a plus sign. You look like an idiot, right? And, and really, so I went to the professor, long story short, I taught myself enough of it really fast. It's not anything brilliant, it's not that hard. So it's great that she'll get that now. She'll have a very big leg up. Same thing with number theory. So she's in good shape. It's like people say, when do you use algebra? You know, but it's more of the training of how to think and analyze as opposed to if you're gonna sit there. I, I haven't done a differential equation problem and I don't know when, but it's good for a habit. Can you give an example? I mean, Well, they, they, I always looked at it, they just didn't want to keep calling stuff just math. So it's just more advanced math. And okay, so okay. Yeah. That, um, that's all it is. is I didn't know if it was something really weird different. I never no, no, no. Yeah. It's just the next step, and then there's stuff beyond that. And when I found that out, I'm like, you have to be kidding me. <laughs> have I not learned enough math? You mean there's more? There's more, yeah. So there's always more, and they'll come up with weird names for it to make you afraid that you don't want to take that class. But, yeah, <laughs> but, but yeah it's just... I mean, it's just it's just a more advanced math class, and I think it's brilliant she's taking it in high school because I first saw it at Georgia Tech. So yeah, yeah, I Fantastic. did the same thing. I I came through and I didn't get any calculus in high school, and I'm now trying to solve that with my tenth grader who is not going to get any calculus because we live in rural Georgia. I don't live in Gwinnett County, unfortunately. Uh, but 
differential equation. Just a real world example for you. I had to have it in geology because that's how you figure out how the water is going to disperse through the soil. So it's like flow dynamics and stuff you use that things in. It's um, used for everything. It's used. It's used a lot more than you think. But like I said, like they said, they give it this cryptic name, and it scares parents. It scares the kids. I hit calculus. And I went, oh my God, I was good at math. What happened? And and it wasn't that I wasn't good at it. I'd just never been exposed to it. So she's really lucky that she's getting that. So so a question for you, sir. What what do you do? What's your field? Uh, I'm an information technology manager. Okay. Okay. So and it, it's it's it sounds awesome that that your daughter is getting access to all these things. It's probably a common question, though, for some people that aren't into math and sciences, and then their kids are getting involved with the stuff, and the parents are going, I, like you, they, what is it? I, I don't know. Is there a good resource that these parents can go to to kind of get that remedial help, yeah, like, what I, are my kids studying? Can I throw in one? Um, even to this day, I'll, I have no shame. I will go to, you know, the, and it's no offense to anyone, it's a set of books called For Dummies, like mm -hmm. this for dummies, I that for dummies, dummies, whatever. Yeah, I, I love them. Um, you can grab that, of course, ask and talk to the teachers in more depth um, and any, you know, colleagues and whatnot. I'll throw another quick thing with differential equations. Really, where I first saw it was in freshman physics. It wasn't even the calculus book. They hadn't gotten to that yet. And it really just has to do with, like, if you had to calculate, you know, say you've got something in motion and then you want to calculate its velocity or acceleration, that's where those little formulas come in. Um, so, so, yeah, just, just grab one of those books, like, and you're... Yeah, I just want to double down on the dummies books because in certain things when that was like the first thing I would do and what the experience I had was they also have like another series called for idiots and yes. then like exam yeah. cram and there's like a bunch of them that are similar and sometimes with me the way I learn I you know concepts you know they build like stair steps and there were some concepts I, I just I couldn't get past like chapter three I did not understand even the dummies explanation of the foundation I was gonna need to learn in this new topic so I would go to I got to the point where I just you know because different authors explain things in different ways and I would get the same book like I would get the dummies version and the idiots version and the exam I would come home with five books on the same topic and I would get so far in one book and then be like, okay, well, I'm not getting this. And then I would just read that same concept in other books until I got it. And then I would go back to the first book and continue. So I could be sitting there with five books, but you know, you do what you gotta do so that you understand it so that you can keep leveling up. And that really helped me is to not just stop and think, oh, well, well I really must be an idiot because I can't get it from one book. I just kept going. Also, you yeah, might check YouTube and I know, I hate to oh, say yeah, that, YouTube, but the, oh, yeah. Khan Academy, I love Khan yeah, Academy, uh, Unimi, uh, I, I was Udacity, Academy. any of those things. Yeah. Um, YouTube's great, I forgot about that. YouTube is free. Uh, Udacity has some stuff that's free that's pretty good. Um, but Can you spell that? U-D-A-C-I-T-Y. Uh, but if you're, if you're raising a teenager like I am, they don't want to read a book. But if you can point them to... A video or something online to do they're much more likely to do it I'm raising a dyslexic computer nerd so he learns everything via video or audio if he can so just be aware that there are a lot of con start at Khan Academy it's really good um, there's yeah. The, yeah. Oh. yeah I mean it, it's like everything yeah, geek and nerdy yeah. that you can think of yeah also Wikipedia Take it with a grain of salt. Yeah, but yeah. if you looked up, for example, differential equations, there's probably an article on Wikipedia, differential equations. Most of it, will the math nerds have probably gone in. It'll make the eyes roll up in the, in the back of my head. I look at it and go, what? But if you read the first three sentences, by I'm a Wikipedia administrator. By policy, those first few sentences are supposed to be a plain English summary of whatever that topic is. We don't always manage it, but it's what's supposed to be. And, and look at the references and the citations at Wikipedia. You know, if, if you didn't get the article, they, there's usually a huge list of citations yeah. that'll point you to other items. And sometimes that's the biggest resource on a Wikipedia page for me is yeah. to see who they're citing and what other places I can go. In the back. Somebody over there had her? Throw, throw her the box. Con, I, throw. Oh, she was going to say Khan Academy. Oh, okay. All right. Don't hit her in the head with the box. Please. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> actually. Uh, so uh, I actually want to build off of that because I'm a senior software engineer right now um, and I'm working at a startup and I'm looking to eventually move into a CTO role in civic tech. That's like right. the direction that I'd like to go. Right. Um, but I taught myself how to code. Um, I learned HTML when I was 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. um, went into my first tech job knowing only HTML and CSS and now I'm a Ruby on Rails developer, which is great. Um, and I've learned a ton on the job. But I know that if I want to go to like a more advanced like C-level, um, I'm probably going to need a little more grounding in math, a little more grounding in algorithms, um, a little more grounding in data analysis. And I don't know if it's really worth it, I'm in my mid-30s, and I don't know if it's really worth it to like go back to school or get a degree in math, or if I should just try and teach myself kind of on the side. I don't know if anybody has any experience like. If you can do Ruby's on Rails, you have yeah. you have my, like, <laughs> I am in awe. I have a computer science master's degree, and if you can understand that, you can do C, you can do Java. Um, math is great. The biggest thing I've found in programming, and y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not so much that you can solve it quickly, but you understand how to put the logic together because you've got to program the logic. Mm -hmm. the, the computer will do the actual math. You just have to put the logic together. But I always, I really like the online resources. And if a degree is, you know, if college is your thing, great. I love college. I'll go back and get a degree anytime somebody wants to pay for my yeah. tuition. Right. Um, mm -hmm. My husband won't let me get my PhD until I finish my paying off my student loans for my last <laughs> master's degree. Um, but if college is not always the right choice for everybody. Um, Very true. But there are a lot of good resources out there. So if you want to do a certificate program or an online program like Udacity, or Khan, well, Khan Academy may not have a, a terminal program for what you're looking for, but you can find things like that. Um, a degree may or may not help you, but there are a lot of options out there. Right. Yeah. So I, I want to speak to this a little bit. Going for CTO, I think that's an amazing goal. Put it on a post it, tape it to your mirror, <laughs> keep yeah. it in mind every single day because it will listen. guide <laughs> every other, you know, should I do this, should I do that? It does it get me closer to my goal? Mm -hmm. So I think that's fantastic. Now, having said that, going for CTO, there's a, many gradations there. You're going to be, you want to start off as a CTO of a small company or you want to be CTO of Apple, you know, where, what your goal is there. So if you're going for a large company, they're probably going to want to be, want to yeah. have a degree, you know, because some companies, if you don't have a degree, degree, they won't hire you. I mean, there's companies I've applied to that have said, oh, you don't have a degree, we're not going to hire you. And I'm like, so you're not hiring me because of something I didn't do 30 years ago. And they say, yep, nope, you know, it's on, it's on their list. They have to do the checkbox that you had a degree. So having a degree does allow checking those boxes. Now, if you want to be a CTO of a smaller company, I would say instead of studying technology, study business. Yeah. Because a small independent company, and I've been involved with multiple startups, they say, oh, you, hey, you, you're CTO. So they're going to expect you to know a lot of things about business and about budgeting. They're not going to expect you to know coding. They're going to expect you to know how to set up a company, a brand new company. So, having so, it depends. Mm -hmm. it, it depends. But I think it's an amazing goal. Go for it. And by the way, you ha you are young. Don't give me this. I'm in my mid thirties. Yeah. I've had I've had students yeah. say, "Oh, if I do my PhD, it's going to take four or five years, and I'll be thirty. I'll be thirty-five. And so I just say to them, "How old will you be if you don't do it?" In five, four or five years. Yeah. Look, so, I, I'm, I'm 44, and I want to start my PhD now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So don't put an age limit on it, because. Yeah. And by so the way, after 55, at a number of institutions, I think state institutions, you don't have to pay tuition. We had a woman on the panel last year who was, I think, 60 or so, and got her PhD after after 55. You have to kind of fight and check. Yeah, it depends yeah. on the state. Yeah. Ask the lawyer there. Georgia what? is Georgia. Georgia is 65. After you're, okay. uh, yeah. after you're 65 in Georgia, you can go tuition free, but you cannot actually receive a degree. Right. You can take classes as long as you want to. It's not, yeah. but it's non-degree. Yeah. My yeah. husband works for the university system. <laughs> Fantastic. At so there you go. There wow. you go. Good. Can I throw yeah. in one quick thing for the next question? Because I know we said a lot about math. Um, a lot of panels I've been on, particularly in universities, and with, with students, right? They'll say, oh, I'm not that great at math, blah, blah, blah. 
You just have to basically if you get through and put up with it. You will not necessarily have to take a lot of math. It depends on what you go. If you go into math, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> if you go into engineering, there's some certain basic classes or key classes, and some of them can be tough or not. But my point in saying all that is, I don't do my, the math I do is on my calculator, which mm -hmm. just conked, conked out a few weeks ago. I had it since 1984. That bad boy was, <laughs> finally died. It's an icon. But I don't sit there. Oh, gotta do math today. I don't like she said. Sometimes it's business, even as a faculty member, I'm doing research, I'm writing proposals to get grants, so actually there's a lot of writing and, and communication skills that one has to have, and sometimes politics. over and above the math, and, and politics. politics. Yeah. So don't freak out if you're not like, oh, I'm not a math person. There is a place for you in STEM and or STEAM that does not necessarily involve a lot of math, and I'm living witness to that. Yeah. And, and I want to toss something in also about age, because I hear a lot of time, oh, I didn't get hired because I'm I'm too old. Well, I also hear people, I didn't get hired because I'm too young. Okay, I didn't get hired because I have a degree. Oh, I didn't because, 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 all right? Companies will hire someone who's skilled. Now, if they have a choice of a lot of people, yeah, their prejudices may, may jump in there. But especially this thing about I didn't get, you know, if I'm older than 55, you know, I don't get hired. I'm living proof this is not true, all right? In fact, I know a lot of companies that want someone with a little gray hair. They want someone who has those years of experience, they'd rather hire someone who's older than someone who's younger. So I'm not saying that prejudice doesn't exist, it's there, but if you're not getting hired, there's a lot of other people that aren't getting hired either that are older, younger, fatter, thinner, wh whatever. So there's many reasons that people don't get hired. Okay. Speak into the box. Oh, okay, um, <laughs> sorry. So, um, I got my undergrad degree in neuroscience. And in, in, I'm sorry, in what? Neuroscience. Neuroscience, great. Sorry, and then I transitioned into business. I got my master's in healthcare administration. Woo! So um, for the last six years, I've been doing diversity and inclusion work at the VA. Yeah. And uh, I focus on an empowerment model with that. Uh, what, I'm w what I was wondering, when we look at external factors and kind of we, we study the literature around this kind of work, mm -hmm. how, do you, or how do you advise someone, because I'm starting to work with I'm going to move towards high school and middle school students with my coaching and mentoring. How do you move so people actually make it through the pipeline when you look at kind of the purest model of professions where it is based on merit and it is based on education versus the ones that aren't as pure, that focus more on the politics? And what experiences have you had to deal with those external factors mm -hmm. that got you w to where you need to? And what were those key things? And let somebody else go first, because I can give you a whole session on that. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, again, it, it depends. Are you going to a large company or are you going to a small company? Larger companies are going to be more careful about discrimination and prejudice, because they know they can get sued, right? So they're going to be very, very careful. Smaller companies, um, it's really bad on the West Coast, in the San Francisco area. There's a whole bunch of tech startups that they won't interview you in the office. They'll say, come to the bar. And they want to interview you in a bar, because they're hiring based on I can hang around this person. This person is like me. And the problem, what they're going to find out rapidly is that if they hire a bunch of people that are all like them, that, that is not a good thing for the company. And the company's probably going to fail because you want a very diverse set of people to get a company going because you want people that know different things. If everybody's thinking alike, there's a problem. You don't need half of them. Okay. You, asked, you asked about getting, I guess, young people through the pipeline. No, you did. What you're doing now is phenomenal. Uh, wait, you uh, how are you defining the fact, how are you saying you didn't make it? I really wanted to be a uh, PhD scientist. You want to be a PhD? But o Oprah Winfrey wanted to be a hard news reporter. But she, it was, it's true, and she, but she found she was very good with getting people to, you know, express, and now she's a billionaire, okay? So whatever you're doing, and God knows I'm, I'm preaching to my own choir when I say this, because I've really worked on myself to work hard, not to like everything self-deprecating, because you get a lot of, as we called it, um, you can imagine my, our family, husband and I both, what we call death by a thousand cuts. You get a lot of little comments. Yeah, I can remember even in, in undergraduate, and I would put the homework group together myself, you know, I'm gonna lead and all that. I'd say, you know, we're gonna meet here, y'all, and blah, blah, blah and talk about a problem and somebody, if I said something, somebody would go, oh, I don't think that's really it. Or if I asked them, oh, that's trivial. And that little stuff, you, you can like, oh, well, no, you know, you can say whatever, but it, it, it seeps in over right. time. So right. for what you're doing, thank you so much. It's phenomenal. And as far as getting, 
And as far as getting young people through the pipeline, the thing that I find probably helps the most, at least one thing, others may have other examples, is as much as you can help them build some sort of community. Like I said, even my homework groups that I put together, quite frankly, um, they were not necessarily all my friends. I mean, there were times when I cried before I, I met in front of them. I didn't want to go. But I knew if I went, I'd get these things done, right? So it just had to plow through it. But that can be pretty wearing. So, but now I find there's a lot more, things like this certainly was, were not around <laughs> when I was coming through. So there's a lot of um, any kind of organizations that you can reach out to. I mean, you can even Google stuff or talk to me afterwards that deal with diversity and whatnot to make a community for these kids so that the person doesn't feel so alone. Because whatever thing you're going through, there's most definitely someone who's going through it. And there's every kind of reason. I mean, even more, most recently, I was in a program. It's, um, long story short, it was a national program for women called Elate, Executive Leadership in Academic Technology and Engineering. And it's supposed to train you for going into higher ed, like deans and presidents and whatnot. And these were, I mean, I was just a professor amongst them. These people there were deans and vice provosts and all these high titles. And you'd be surprised at the amount of death by a thousand cuts people at even the highest levels have suffered, particularly women. And the insecurities that are still there that you know we're managing. But with that community now, I have a group that I could get on email, any, a number of you, there were 26 people selected that year throughout the nation, but they have many contacts. Some have done startups, some are in academia, some are in business, or um, uh, you know, I have one friend that's a neuroscientist and she became an opera singer. So, you know, your talents don't have to be in just one realm, but try to get whatever community you can build for, if particularly young people, make them, you know, have a, a group that meets once a month or something. Or uh, Society of Women Engineers, or if it's, you know, a given ethnic minority, Na National Society of Black Engineers. You can go, there's one for Hispanic and so forth. And, and even issues of gender right now, you can get with, talk to me later, but a lot of sociologists, psychologists are studying gender factors that, that I learned that there's, I know there's more than one gender, but I learned, for example, if you see a letter S, when you see LGBTQ, and you see an S with a, up with a uh, what do you call it, superscript of one half, that stands for two spirits, which is part of the Native American or indigenous communities or First Nations, if you're in Canada, communities of people feeling, that they, or, or being of two spirits, right, male, female, et cetera. So there's a lot out there that if you can try to give people a community so that, you know, any even people as well, there's in science people run into, I have someone who said, you know, I, I'm a Christian, I, you know, and I am too, and, you know, I, I feel like all the scientists are atheists. That's not true. <laughs> in fact, it's kind of hard to find a black atheist, to be honest with you. But um, <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> I need help, okay? But, but there, find a community and work yeah. with that. We'll talk more, if you like, after. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just to add on to that briefly, I've seen especially, like, who's on some, like, Dragon Con social media or any social media groups? Okay, like, one of the big things leading up to Dragon Con every year is a lot of posts where it says, am I the only one who, or am I the only one who feels like this, or is this just me? And I have never seen that question posted anywhere where the answer is yes. Like you are never the only one going through that experience or you're never the only one who's had that thought. So is, and, and I, a question pops into my head sometimes too. Um, and, and I just have to constantly remind myself that whenever that thought forms in my head, I have to remind myself no, and places like Dragon Con and academic, academic conferences and industry trade shows and all that, they're all evidence that no, you're not the only one and that you just have to remember you're, you're not the only one and take that next step to reach out and ask the questions and get help and then go from there. Because some whatever you're thinking of, somebody else has probably thought of it and solved it or come up with some good solutions that you can try for yourself. Especially with middle schoolers. I work, the, the, what I do now, we, we are concentrating on how to get girls back into technology and underrepresented minorities back into technology. It's a big push in, for uh, my group, and it's especially my pet project. But uh, we lose middle schoolers, especially middle school girls, and we don't know why. We're doing a lot of research trying to figure that out, but a lot of it is boiling down to they just don't feel like they fit. So if you can get a group going with middle school girls and you build them a community and you show them that they're just as good at technology and they're just as good with the robot kits and they're just as good with, you know, computers and stuff, they're more likely to stay in it. But, you know, because up until fifth grade, they're just as enthusiastic, mm -hmm. just as involved in math and science and STEM related classes. But somewhere between 
sixth and eighth grade, somebody told them that, oh, that's not what you're supposed to do. That's for the boys. And I'm, I'm working really hard. I'm raising two boys, but I'm working really hard to get the, the, the <laughs> middle school girls back into it. I am so outnumbered at my house, it's not even funny. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, Right. Um, they are trying to, to have this, but the people that go very well so far that have opened it and are actually just reading high school, um, they're very legalized. Yeah, come okay. talk to me. All right, okay, who has the box? Ah! Hello. Um, I actually don't have a question. I, I can't hear you. Okay, hold it. Hello, sorry. Ah. Hello. <laughs> I just wanted to build on that a little bit as well. Um, my name's Caitlin, I'm also an aerospace Into engineer box. from Georgia Tech. Um, Yay! <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it it really depends on like exposure. Like I didn't really know aerospace engineering was a thing when I was in grade school, and then it wasn't until like I had a dream, like I wanted to be a musician, and then like I just I got my acceptance letter from Georgia Tech, and I was like, God, oh, screw it, I'll go for it, and checked the aerospace box, and never looked back. Unfortunately, it worked out for me, but like I, I kind of wish I had exposure when I was young to, okay, well, what's all out there? Um, and I loved math and science when I was a kid, um, and you know, the community is so important. Uh, so thank you to all the lovely ladies here <laughs> who are making a difference and reaching out. Oh, so thank you. <laughs> that side is so, yeah, this side is so there. quiet. <laughs> One, two, three. I got three here, too. Oh, you saw some here. Okay. So I feel a little repetitive, but I'm also building off of that, um, kind of building off of your like getting middle school girls. And, and is this too? Is that enough? No, 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 yeah. Okay. So techie in here, fix it, please. <laughs> it, it sounds really weird and like I know. from my you got feedback. Yeah. Engineer that. Yeah. Anyway, um, I was actually one of those middle school girls that was told like you know, you know science and math are for boys, like you should be interested in art or drama and all that. Um, and then actually it was uh, Georgia Tech, even though I didn't go there, um, that got me back involved in science and math. And actually, Kim, I think you taught one of my classes. <laughs> no, I don't teach. Well, no, it was like it was the uh, women in engineering. There is um, an aerospace section. Uh -huh. um, and 2004, 2005, um, even if you weren't teaching me, I'm pretty sure I saw you around Public there. Speaker, maybe they saw a video with no, you it later. Be. Yeah. It, might, it might have been a video or something like that. But, um, <laughs> I, I did that for as long as I possibly could, and then I went on to like start a little like web development startup like that got me through college um, until I like then it just because that's where I first learned pro that's where I first like was introduced to like programming and science and even though I sucked at aerospace um, <laughs> everything like you know computer science got me back involved so anyway just thank you and if that's still going on at Georgia Tech it needs more funding. <laughs> Hi, um, so my question is kind of related to the pipeline issue um, and sort of a synthesis of the external internal obstacles. So women, I believe I'm correct in saying that women are more likely to take an extended period of time off from their careers for various reasons. Um, and I think especially in science, it's difficult to get back on track. How would one do that if one has taken um, some time away from industry? Um, you have children? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I, children. I, 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 yes. Well, we've got two sons, and um, quite honestly, I, it, like I said, sometimes the internal and external issues. So I'll tell you like one thing, like don't do this, and then I'll tell you the other thing of you know. So our first child was born, and quite, and he was a preemie, but thank God he was healthy. He was just really tiny, and I went back to work not full time, but I was going back in checking my mail. We still had mail in the box and all that. Like a week later. And one of my colleagues, I didn't, and also being, I was the only woman in the entire school of engineering at Duke. I, I didn't know that quite when I hired on, but okay. Only, you know, person of color. So that, when somebody came to speak once, they stopped me a week later and went, you? And I'm like, what? And they said, I came to your school, to College of Engineering to speak. 
And I look across the audience, and there's just all these bald heads and white beards and you sitting in the middle. <laughs> yeah, that was true. So I, we, we had you know, our first child, and I went back. I didn't tell anybody I was pregnant. I was much tall, skinnier then, and I wore kind of blousy stuff anyway. The only person who really knew was my next door office colleague and, my, and the chair, who, um, we, let's put it this way, at that time there were, were people, I'll just say, I won't say exactly who, but people who would call, like say if a woman was teaching part time in, which we had, and she had a second child, and he said, well, how do you plan to work now that you have two children? You know, which is illegal, right? But you, you still hear this stuff. So that's why I'm like, push it through. You know, I would go in. But the truth of the matter was, well, fortunately, physically, I was healthy enough to do that. Um, and, and somebody came up to me, and, I, and they said, oh, you, you've been going a, a little, I didn't, haven't seen you in a couple of weeks. Uh, how you been? I went, oh, I'm fine. I had a baby last week. And he went, oh, I thought you were just gaining weight, you know? <laughs> I'm serious. And my husband, who's an OBGYN, told me, he says, Theater, they're not going to know you're pregnant. The men in your department won't even know. And it wasn't because I wasn't showing. He said they won't know it. And he was absolutely right. But to get back in, because I've had friends do the same thing, the, again, you do your best to find. I was, not in a, I was not in a supportive environment for having kids. And when we had our second, my attitude was, y'all are going to pay for this out of insurance before I leave, because I'm, I, you know, we're having, and, and he's wonderful, he's back there, I don't know if he's texting his fellow, and I, yeah, there he is, right? So, so is that the preemie? no, no, the, the preemie is his older brother, um, and, and, but that, that one was regular size. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the kid who's shy about speaking, but he speaks French, Spanish, and English, and he got a little bit of Mandarin. But anyway, the point is, back to your question, is, um, I mean, he's, he's smart, he's super smart, is um, proud mommy. I got it, I got it, I got it. He came in first place in physics in the state as a middle schooler, and I did not help. All I did was bring the Subway sandwich, I did not help. Peyton, Peyton, stand up for, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the bottom line is you have to find out so to speak, what the, the rules are, and also kind of know the name of the game. I actually did not know that at my institution at that time, I actually ran into a faculty member who was in history, another woman, and happened to mention I was pregnant. She goes, oh, you know you get a semester off with pay, and they stop the tenure clock. I had no clue. Now, I was going to go and find out. I wasn't, like, totally dense. But that was not anything that was known in my department. Another woman at another university, one of my friends and colleagues told me that when she got pregnant, they said, well, we'll treat it like a heart attack. You know, meaning like if a guy had a heart attack, what kind of time off would he have and so forth. Now there are schools, I'm talking academically because I, I leave my colleagues to speak to the other areas. There are universities that are certainly more progressive and you know, you can try to find out, you know, when you talk to the benefits office and everything, what the rules are. And as long as you are, so to speak, following the rules, but also yes, you have to manage the politics, but if the rules are on your side, then essentially the law is on your side. Now. If you take extended time off, that depends on you. I was okay with going back to work, to my mom work, my grand, you know, all this sort of thing, and we had daycare and all that, and I think he turned out okay. Um, and his older brother, too, who's a com computer scientist with, you know, Intel, he got his master's and so forth. So um, you have to kind of get the mindset if, if you, I know there's certainly there's things as postpartum depression, which thank God I didn't have, but um, if you can get the mindset of, I'm going to do this, I, I want this, just like anything else, right? We wanted kids, and my husband kind of had to work on me, because so I was a big chicken. I mean, I knew we'd have them, but we had them a little later. Cause, and then finally he said, well, if you don't have it, give, go ahead and have it now. You're going to have to do an amniocentesis, and, um, you know, and our insurance was going to change. So the first kid I call the insurance baby, because we had the really good insurance. <laughs> you know, get him in there. Oh, okay, yeah, no. but, but the point is you have to get your mindset. When I, when I, it breaks my heart when I hear women say things like, oh, you know, I, I feel so guilty, I'm going back to work. No, your example of what you're showing your kids, if that's what you want to do, and if you want to be a stay-at-home mom full-time, God bless you, that's fine too. There's nothing wrong with it. You just have to get in your mind what you want and a little bit of planning and hopefully know the environment and the rules that you're in and work from there. There's no one formula. And as far as working to get back in, like anything else, if you had a, a severe injury and you had to do physical therapy, right, you do the work you need to do to get back on the ball. So you might have to watch a lot of YouTube videos or read a lot of books or whatever you need to do. Keep in touch with colleagues, okay? But get in your mind, hopefully, if you can, you know, what, I, what you want. Make that a goal like any other goal 
and then decide how you're going to proceed through it. If you're going to stay at home a year or two, if you're going to go back to work, don't go back in a week. That was dumb. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, I w you know. Anyway, but you 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 have to decide, and then just like any other goal, work on it. That's that's my only answer. Yeah, we just had someone take a, a year off. Um, she works on the Curiosity rover, and she's absolutely brilliant. And her name is Kim, and it's not me. But um, <laughs> but I was so glad to get my Kim twin back. Um, but yeah, she took a year off. She came back. I mean, you know, the first week she worked half time, and the second week she worked, you know, three quarters time, and then she was back full time. Uh, but she's doing it, and she's and fantastic, and she looks fantastic. By the way, don't forget, there's also paternity leave. A lot of yeah. companies and universities don't always tell you, and sometimes the men, or p politically, it may not seem like the astute thing to do, particularly if you're going for tenure or whatnot. But again, there is paternity leave. And, so the and there's something called FMLA, right? Family, family, family yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't go back to work the next week, but I was working on my master's degree when my oldest son was born. And when I found out I was pregnant, I went to all my professors and I said, hey, you know, wasn't really planned, but, you know, it's happening. So um, what do I need to do? And the, my, the head of my department at the time, it was when I get my education degree, and you would think teachers, they would be really good at this, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I said, oh, no problem. Have the baby. We'll put you out on medical, whatever they called it, for students at that time. And uh, you can just finish the semester, the last few weeks of the semester, when you come back. Uh, well, it turns out the professor that was teaching my class decided to retire in the middle of that semester. And they're like, oh, well, if you don't finish it with her, you have to do the whole semester all over again. So I left on Wednesday from class, Wednesday night, had a baby on Thursday and was back in class Wednesday night the next week because I couldn't lose, well, I thought I couldn't lose all that time and take a semester off. And the men in my class went, oh, you, you look different today. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was not one of those nice, one of those people that could hide a pregnancy under a big shirt. I was waddling whale, you know, I gained 60 pounds. And, and the, the women just looked at him and went, she had a baby. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, one little bit of advice I would have on that is sometimes I've worked for bigger companies and smaller companies and startups and organizations that were the biggest of their kind in the state at the time. And one thing I've started to do is document things because sometimes I might need to talk to like five or ten people or get transferred around or send an email, but they're on vacation. and. Like just step one, figuring out who to talk to. And so that I can say, this person referred me to this person and here's the email they sent me and have everything written down and have a trail. And then when you finally get an answer, make sure that's in writing or if it's already you know, in a policy somewhere that you can cite. So then if that person goes on vacation, you don't have to start from the beginning. You can say, here's what's happened so far. Here's where we at, are at now. Do I need to get it in writing? Do I need to get a signature? What can I do? So if you come back a year later, then, you know, that next person you're dealing with, you can get them up to speed on this was the agreement before I left and here's where we're going from here and just kind of get things reiterated and straightened out so nobody's surprised by anything and you don't have to start over and talk to more people. Hi, so I'm a microbiology student getting my PhD at the University of Tennessee. <laughs> And uh, I am fully aware that imposter syndrome is a major issue. Would and you like so, to talk a little bit about what that is for people who might not sure. know? Sure. So imposter uh, syndrome you is... Know, how many people here know what imposter syndrome is? Okay. How many people don't know what imposter syndrome is? All right. Go for it. So imposter syndrome is um, an issue where you feel like you're an imposter uh, among professionals. Um, and so, um, so I, I, you know, as a graduate student, I obviously struggle with this. Um, but how do you overcome uh, this feeling of imposter syndrome, especially when you know you're aware that you're making progress, albeit small progress, um, but it feels like you're not making any headway at all because you physically can't see that all right. progress. The, 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 and thank you for bringing it up because it's definitely something we need to talk about. The first 
step towards dealing with imposter syndrome is being aware that there is something called imposter syndrome. That when you're having those self-doubts, question, okay, are these valid self-doubts or is this imposter syndrome kicking in? And being aware that a lot of people go through this. And I think painting with a broad brush, I think it's more likely to affect women than men, but it does affect men too. Um, for me, it has been one of my internal obstacles. I'll go up against something and I'll think, eh, I'm not the right person for this, I'm not smart enough, I'm not educated enough. All these things come in. And a que if we have time, I don't think we will, but a question that would be great for the panel here would be, if you could go back 20, 30 years to your younger self and give her advice, what, what advice would you give? And I'm guessing that for most of them it would have something to do with imposter syndrome, about uh, you know being aware that you're smarter than you think you are, being aware that other people in the room, just because they're acting all confident, doesn't mean they're confident. Yeah. <laughs> um, it doesn't mean they're right. Yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> doesn't mean they're right. Right, right. So, so that's my advice. What do other people think about imposter syndrome? I, I would throw into that. I know a gentleman right now, speaking of affecting men and women, who's like got every award short of a Nobel Prize because you don't get a Nobel as an engineer. And he said he lived with or in, imposter syndrome for years through grad school. So it's not uncommon. And the first thing is, Alanka said, is to acknowledge it. And the second thing is, yes, there were people who were put on like they know more. I remember one of our kind of homework groups extended. There was a woman, a young woman in college who always talked about taking the high level classes as a freshman, blah, blah, blah. And we found out later she was flunking. She was a freshman taking senior level classes because she wanted to whatever. And the people saying, you know, oh, that's trivial, whatever. There's a lot of people who do that for self-protection like anything else, right? Some people are mean so, so that you won't be mean to them first. So the fact that you know that is phenomenal. The second thing is once again, find where you can get help in community. There is nothing wrong with going to talk to a counselor, whether that's a psychological person, a medical person, a clergy person, whatever you know, works for you, to get that, those feelings on the table. And you have to be careful you know, who you talk to. With, not, with that, get somebody you, know, you can talk to in confidence and who works for you. You might go to one, even a psychiatrist, but that may not work for you. You may go to, you know, whatever. So you have to find who, what person or persons work, like we said before, with community, whether that's confidentially, medically, or whether that's, you know, outside, uh, just with a group, and find out. It's taking me years, I'll tell you, literally years. I just named, right, top schools in the country. I didn't come out thinking I was the smartest thing on the block as I keep referring to my husband, because he remembers this stuff even better than I do. But I remember in grad school, a guy telling me straight up, because something had happened in the lab, and it was a bad, you know, I let the liquid nitrogen run out and didn't realize it because I was so focused on, you know, I don't want to do anything wrong. And this one guy who there goes, uh, uh, you know, are uh, you going to mess up everything and everybody else is going to mess up the equipment for everybody? I mean, after all, you're a loser and everybody knows it. And I felt like a gut punch. But I also felt like, and I'm not trying to do just because Black Panther's a big movie, but I felt like the ancestors honestly rose up in me and said, no, I'll show you. And so essentially I did, but that affected me for years. Mm. It took me years to get out of that. It was just some, one person, said, and he was, he was just another student. He was nothing. I don't even know what happened to him. I, and he I, also was the only person who showed up at my defense. I didn't want anybody showing up. Again, because I was like, oh, I just want to get the professors. I want to make. And he showed up. And when I got to the door, I'll kid you not, I'm not trying to get preachy or everything, but that's just, I'll tell you, that's who I am. You know? So I got to the door and I said, okay, God, we got this. Because I looked at him and I felt like, okay, you're the devil. We got this, babe. <laughs> and, and I did. I, I finished my defense, and when I was done, you know, we are walking down the hall later. I happened to run into this guy, and he goes, oh. He goes, oh, I guess now you're um, Dr. Theta. I guess that sounds kind of weird, huh? I said, not to me, and kept walking. Ah. But that didn't mean I felt good about it. And it yeah. took me years to, I, you, to sometimes you got to, as they say, fake it till you make it. But find help when you can, whether it's even coming to a panel or with people afterwards that can support you. Because there's a lot of people going through that who are actually very successful. And a lot of people who, who they're, they're, the way they were even brought up is to undermine others. Sometimes they don't even know they're doing it, and sometimes that's just the culture you work in. You know, stab, stab, stab. There's the, and there are, there's a lot of mean people in the world. Doesn't mean you have to hang around them. You can find other people to be even, next to. Even if they're your brother. And if you, <laughs> and if you work for them, find out the rules, find out the law, because sometimes you may have to take 
that in hand if necessary. I mean, yeah, I know it's a risk on jobs and whistleblowers and it's all kind of issues, but you just have to maneuver through the waters, as they say, you know, with the sharks. But you can find your way. You can do this. Like, Alanka is brilliant, right? She said she doesn't have a degree, but she taught herself all kinds of stuff. People have heard say they taught themselves, right? Well, and I have a brother that went to Georgia Tech yeah. who informed me regularly that I didn't go to a real school because I went to the University of West Georgia. I have four degrees. He has one. But for years, I've always felt like he was smarter than me because he went to a real school, and I finally... He just said that no matter where he went. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And no finally, with Georgia Tech. Yeah, that's, no. and sometimes <laughs> it's more about the other person. It's not about you at all. What but they're saying is not a reflection of you. It's a reflection of them and the person they are. Right. It, it's like, what, what, just follow, riffing off of what she said, that idea of it uh, reflects on them and not on you. It's that if someone is mean to you, think to yourself, would I say that to someone? Would I say that to someone? No, mean. it's mean. Okay. I just wanted to get some opinions on the possible effects or ethics of enforcing gender ratios in science and technology industries or possible government agencies. I, I wonder how that, um, thank you very much for asking that question, because I, I was sitting here thinking about, well, you know, what the question about what do, you know, if I could give myself from 20 years ago advice, um, like salary research. Like, because I found out it made less than other people who were not any more qualified than me. And then I had to, like, say, hey, why am I being paid less? And then get a back raise. And so, um, yeah, I wonder how that might have an effect on what people get paid, if that's more a part of the discussion from the very beginning of your career and not something you find out after you've already been working a place for a year or two or even longer. And I'm sure some people have heard about a court case where a woman found out she made less over, I think it's Lily Ledbetter, right? Or she, that she had made less for decades and they were like, oh, it's too late now. And you know, I'm hoping that the, the conversations we're having in today's climate help change that over time so that's not as much of an issue or an issue at all for people coming up now and going forward. All right, I, I think we're out of time, but uh, <laughs> your there we go, yeah. Uh, I hope that this has been helpful to everyone, learning about other people's external obstacles and maybe ways of dealing with your own internal obstacles. I have Adam. a free giveaway here when you're done. <laughs> okay. And I'm happy to talk to anybody afterwards. Yeah. I am going to do my, my, my sorry little, but as best as I can, put on something for Wakanda and go to the photo shoot at 2.30 out on the patio. <laughs> but if you're hanging out, you know, if All you right. see us, see me. Yeah, and I want a picture talk. of everyone before we oh, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, have a great Dragon Con. Who wants it? Who wants it? Okay, come and get it, come and get it.